June 16, 1966, when the Freedom Riders arrived in Greenwood, Mississippi, the violence took another turn. I was almost run over by a car that screeched through the margers with a swastika banner on its side. Rocks and bottles greeted the speakers, and Stokely Carmichael was arrested. Yes, it was the same town the three civil rights workers were later found murdered in. It was after Stokely's release when he made his black power speech that was to divide the civil rights movement forever. From that day on the march, from that day on, the march was a two-week debate on tactics. It intensified when the tear gas and clubs greeted us in Canton, Mississippi. I can remember that at the end of the Mississippi March for Freedom, we were all lining up to march into Jackson. It was June 26, 1966, and we were tired and we were depressed. The rifle butts, the tear gas, and the billy gloves in Canton, Mississippi had turned us around, and most of us felt that the nonviolent civil rights movement of Dr. King's needed a new direction. We tried to make the atmosphere seem like that of a victory parade and joked about where we were going next. I told Stokely Carmichael that I heard we were going on to Louisiana. He laughed and said, I'll be right behind you. Shortly before he died, Dr. Martin Luther King <clears throat> Jr. made this important statement that all liberals must think about today. Dr. King said, it is one thing to throw a coin to a beggar. It is another to address the edifice that creates beggars. With our two-party system in shambles, and both controlled by the fundraisers, we have liberal Americans. We, as liberal Americans, have no way left to address the edifice except in the streets. I know that it's coming. I fear for our young people. We realists have to prepare for that and develop leadership that will help avoid the violence that I'm sure is coming. Thank you. That was wonderful. I think your dad was prescient in his observations um, from the historical perspective. And he wrote that part in 2007. Is that about right, Ruby? And, and 2008, there's one excerpt in there that was written about five months before he died. Um, having prepared for this show and uh, watching a bunch of the speeches and we watched the democracy now speech yeah i was struck and i had cold chills about how observant all the people involved in those um actions and activities you know 45 50 years ago um were they they saw the future already and we're living it every day we can we can substitute the words Vietnam, the words Alabama, the words Mississippi, with, with right. new words that are that are still like fun. Oakland, right? Oakland, yeah, you know, it just Chicago, it just goes on and on. Yeah. Um, maybe if you if you could, could you tell us what your dad's relationship with Dr. King was? Sure. Um, my dad got involved with the civil rights movement. Um. Through the American Friends Service Committee, he was the director of that in uh, Hartford, and he was also an organizer for uh, SNCC, which was Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, and on the ground, uh, once he started going to the, you know, down south, um, and we had some marches up here too, but uh, and in D.C. of course, but he worked uh, media and security because <laughs> he always needed that. And um, what he basically did, he was known as the Voice of the South Radio at that time. My dad was a, uh, was a disc jockey for many, many years prior to that. But anyway, he, um, he would tape interviews along the march routes, and, uh, and then he would find a payphone, and he would play the tapes into the, play, into the uh, payphone, uh, and they would be broadcast uh, to the radio stations. So I just so want to point out that your, your dad was... A, a new media leader of the time, much like live streamers are today. Yeah, he certainly would be a live streamer, yes. Um, 
Well, that's that's really kind of cool to hear because you know just as a a point of how to get information out there, you use the tools and the resources at hand, and you know it's like extraordinarily impressive to hear that story. Now, in reading through the articles and doing the research, um, your dad was one of the Freedom Riders. Is that correct? It is. It is correct, and he organized a lot of the buses that came. Uh, from the north um, that went into Greenwood and Selma and uh, of, of, of numerous places that uh, that I can't list off the top of my head, but they um, they organized, basically the Freedom Riders were from all over the country, and they would assemble at a march location, and um, they were referred to as outside agitators and unwelcome most of the time. Um, and that's... Uh, that's really the, the the formation of the Freedom Riders' history. Um, and I, it looked to me like he did a lot of work in the Mississippi area. Um, just reading through, through the articles, um, he did. And were were you, I'm assuming were you a, a child at that time? Your where was your family living? Uh, we were living in in the suburbs in Connecticut. And so, and he, my father left. He had left a very lucrative job. He was in advertising at that point, uh, working for a television station locally here, and um, had four young children and um, said, I'm going to Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> and did, um, did I, I never thought to ask you this, but did you or any of the rest of your family ever get a chance to meet Dr. King personally? Um, we did, and he was, he gave a speech in Hartford. Um, I don't remember the name of the church, but he did come to Hartford and give a speech, and we did. And I think, I'm almost positive I was at Riverside Church, too. I think I met him at Riverside, too. Mm-hmm. And, you know... He's a nice guy. <laughs> as a young, I was going to ask you, as a young person, what kind of impression did did he make you know when he you was were able a dad to... i mean dr king was a was a, a very uh um he was just a gentle person and surrounded himself with gentle people i met an awful lot of very very nice people um, when i was a kid well one of the things i've been interested in reading is he was a hundred percent totally committed to peaceful nonviolent revolution um, Correct. And I did read a little bit about his uh, first meeting with, with Malcolm X and how he yes. differed in tactics. And I think you spoke to that a little bit um, yes. in, in the part you you read. And, um, you know, it was really, it's inspiring that he was able to stay true to his vision in the face of um, so much anger and so much meanness uh, being inflicted on on the movement and you know the dissension within i mean he worked very hard to overcome it i think it was a great object lesson um i wanted to ask about two particular things i read the first one was your dad wrote an article and he he started off the body of it with the his quote this was your dad's quote don't be a blind follower. Right. I was wondering if you could speak to that a little bit. Um, tell us, you know, amplify on what, what he meant and why. Well, Dad was very always aware of the fact that people were going to um, use the movement and use the uh, press it was generating to further their own agendas. And um, there were a lot of people, you know, it, my father was um, a mediator. He, he did an awful lot of meetings between uh, Dr. King and Stokely Carmichael and, uh, and uh, Malcolm X. And uh, my father liked Malcolm X a lot. He just, and he understood him. Um, uh, but I think that uh, for a lot of people who don't really know all there was to know about what was happening at the time, they may look at it as giving up, you know, that people had given up. And I I think that his main thing was education. Educate yourself. If you're going to stand behind something or if you're going to stand for something, make damn sure you know what it is. 
basically. Um, which is a good... Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, it does, because, I mean, a lot of times, and one of the things I take issue with in the movement today is, you know, people are so reactionary, and, you know, somebody will make a statement, and it, it spreads like wildflower because of our digital technology, so it's not sourced, you know, the accuracy is some, um, and people get behind an idea or or a comment without knowing the substance of it. So I think it's really good to to have a historical example. And and I can amplify a little bit if I can recall the article. Um, the He brought that quote up about uh, the Jenna 6 that were the Louisiana yes, kids. And yes. he was referencing, you know, how, okay, you know, Dr. King would have stood behind this. Dr. King would have stood behind that. Dr. King would have stood behind this, but he would not stand behind something else. That he was very selective and and intelligent about. He just didn't have this blanket policy, you know, that was black and white. This is good. This is bad. That he took the right. information and 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 digested it and and tried to feel or determine whether it fit consistently with his moral and ethical values and what he was trying to accomplish. And I think that's a good good advice for all of us. I mean, we rush into things a little bit. Um, yes, and I think when he was talking about the Genesis uh, situation, which was they had, uh, the white tree at the school, I, I'm sure most people are familiar with that. And then there was a, a terrible beating uh, that followed that. And, I, and retaliation was not something that Dr. King believed in. And it was not something that my father believed in. And I think that there was a lot of exploitation um, when Malcolm X and Stokely Carmichael um, began to move away from... Uh, they, they got they got angry. And, uh, I mean, they were beaten and <laughs> murdered. And, you know, there were hangings still and people were disappearing. And it was a very, very, very violent time. And like you said, it was... Um, it was impossible for some people to turn the other cheek. Um, and even with that, Dr. King brought um, quite a, a large compassion and a lot of love to the situation. I was struck how when he would reference instances like that, he, he was never critical. He was very compassionate and Correct. trying to always reach understanding and uh you know he was he was a bridge builder and he he had um good you know the best of intentions and never never strayed from that course and it must have been a huge struggle uh for him because he was working against epic forces uh within and without um i want to kind of wrap it up with okay um i want to get a little bit more feedback on what your dad's observations were on the first election of Barack Obama to the presidency. And I want to set this up a little bit because I want people to know where he was coming from. Um, my understanding is that your father had worked with Dr. King and that he he tragically passed away on inauguration day of the first Obama presidency, is that correct? Yes. So he lived to see uh, Barack Obama, the first black man in the United States, elected to president. And he yes. had some commentary about that. So would love to uh, for you to share some of that with us. Well, I think my father was, um, he wasn't very popular in the quote-unquote liberal community for uh, not you know, supporting Obama the way people assumed that he would. Um, uh, it's kind of funny because at his memorial service, we had a, a friend from the marches. His name was Leroy Moulton. He was from Selma, Alabama. And um, and he said, we did it, Dave. We, we did, you know, we have a black president. And he actually spoke to that at, at the uh, at this funeral. But that didn't care if you were green or purple or blue. And, you know, in the South, in those days, they referred to blacks in the nicest way was colored. And Dad would always say, what color? <laughs> it, was, it was kind of a standing joke with him. But, um, but addressing what Dr. King would have uh, 
summarized as the content of your character to my father was far more important than the fact that Barack Obama was black. And um, I think I addressed that a little bit in the in the, what I read earlier too. That um, both parties are are bought and paid for, and, and both uh, and the entire system is broken down to the point where you know you could run uh, um, anyone for president provided they had enough money behind them. And um, and I think that that's the way he looked at. Uh, the presidency of Barack Obama. I think he wanted it to be successful. I think, you know, of course he um, appreciated the uh, what it took to uh, uh, have a black man rise uh, uh, through the ranks and become president of the United States of America on the one side. And on the other side, he was very fearful that it was going to be a huge disappointment. And so, you know, he. my dad was very... Visionary. He he very much uh, looked back, and he very much looked forward. And so, and he had a tremendous understanding of history. Um, he educated himself his entire life on living into the future based on what we've learned in the past. And I think that that was something that just because Barack Obama was black did not speak to the content of his character. Um. And it, it kind of references back to that statement about don't be a blind follower. Um, Correct. Yeah, you, you know, right, because I, I saw Amy Goodman speak immediately after the first election, and she went down a laundry list about, yeah, this is good, this is a positive step, but here's the things right. we need to watch for. And right. it was difficult to imagine at the time, but everything she said came to pass. And so your dad was doing the same thing, you know, in his, his you know, final commentaries. He was telling us, you know, this is good, but it's not the end of the road, and we need to be aware and hold people accountable. I agree. So I want to thank you so much for speaking with us tonight. I know it's not an easy time for you, but, um, you know, it's the anniversary of your, your dad's passing, but he absolutely would be proud of what you've done here tonight, and thank you for sharing some of his stories with us. Well, thank you very much for having me, and I, I really appreciate an opportunity to um, to honor my father because he was a very gifted brilliant compassionate person so thank you all right well have a good night and stick around you know we're going to have the documentary so thank you thank you so much for speaking with us okay bye-bye love you all